Good morning and welcome to Atlantic Council Front Page, uh, the Atlantic Council's premier live platform for global leaders uh, tackling uh, the greatest world challenges. I'm Fred Kemp, I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Patrick Pouinet, Chairman and CEO of Total Energies, uh, as the featured guest uh, for today's edition, hosted by the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center, and the team, by the way, is just back uh, from our Global Energy Forum in Abu Dhabi, where we've had a lot of these conversations. Uh, so thank you, Patrick, for joining us in our headquarters. Uh, thank you to our studio audience, and thank, thank you to our viewers uh, around the world. Um, as we move from a tumultuous year in energy markets, uh, courtesy of uh, Putin's war in Ukraine, it has become clearer than ever uh, that global unity and colla collaboration are in uh, crucial uh, to ensuring a, a smooth and swift energy transition. We were just in Abu Dhabi, and uh, there we learned that um, Dr. Sultan al Jaber would be the uh, COP president designate. And he's really sending a very strong message of common cause among hydrocarbon uh, producers and, and the climate community. Uh, and on the one hand, it seems like that's exactly what should happen, but on the other hand, it also rings a little bit utopian. Uh, so, uh, Patrick, there's no one better positioned than you to speak on geopolitical energy landscape, related to energy security, private energy landscape, role of public-private partnerships, but maybe you can start with this idea that COP28 can be the coming together uh, of the hydrocarbon community and the climate community to take on issues of common cause. Yeah, it's an opportunity like all COP, but I think uh, my view is that uh, this COP taking place in uh, all producing country, uh, Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates, it trades the bar for the whole oil and gas industry. In fact, uh, if you want uh, for me the, uh, this COP to be a success, that means that the oil and gas industry has to engage as a lot of stakeholders are expecting us to do it. And I think uh, for, uh, for Sultan al Jaber, this is a challenge, of course, obviously, and we've seen the challenge, even uh, uh, the personal attacks, which could see from one camp of some camps. Uh, there is nothing personal. I think Sultan has been uh, historically the one who uh, created uh, Mazda, which is quite uh, one of the largest renewable energy company uh, in the world. But at the same time, uh, again, for me, it raises a bar. So that means that uh, we are, or all oil and gas community has to, uh, to, 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 to engage. And there are issues like, for example, but on which we, we have the answer. I think the, the methane emissions, which came uh, high on the agenda in Glasgow, for example, when we look at it in total energies, uh, I put my teams, we can easily, I mean easily, it takes a little time, but uh, not much money to, uh, to, to lower the emissions by 80% in this decade. And, and so I think the, the industry must be serious about it because, by the way, methane is linked to natural gas. Natural gas is an energy of the transition. So there are technological answers to all these, uh, I would say, attacks and the emissions. So let's tackle the emissions and let's commit together, not only, by the way, the IOCs, the international companies, but also the national oil companies. And it's where maybe Sultan Jaber has an important role. Because in our industry, as you know, most of uh, the production is coming from national companies, and they, meet, they need to engage as well in this uh, climate, uh, climate challenge, and probably that's the role of Sultan Jaber to be the leader of his NOCs. So that's very interesting. This will be a cop to raise the bar for the, uh, uh, the hydrocarbon industry, oil and gas industry potential methane emission reduction of 80% by when? By, the, by 2030, by, and we are uh, on the path to do this. Um, and then the working together. But you know, on methane, my motto in the company is aiming to zero methane, yeah. like for fatalities. Because really, I think this is fundamental. Again, natural gas is an, a fundamental energy for the transition. It emits twice less than coal. If we were able at COP28 to decide that we transform all the coal fire power plant in gas fire power plants, immediately we'll be on the trajectory of net zero. But it's not superb technology behind it. I'm not sure we can engage all the countries to do that because question of affordability, gas is, is more expensive than coal, but that's an easy, it's an easy way to, to, to make progress. Maybe, and to make, we know that decarbonization is going from, through electrification, 
So an electrification is not only renewable mm -hmm. because it's intermittent. So the combination natural gas and renewables is the solution. Uh, but to do that, we need to eliminate these methane emissions. I think, I think it's terrific that you focused on natural gas. When we were in Abu Dhabi at our conference, there was a very, uh, I say, entertaining and informative panel of uh, Minister Suhail from the UAE and Minister Al Kabi from Qatar. And, uh, and uh, these are two countries that haven't always got along, but those two ministers had a really interesting conversation with each other, where when I mentioned that gas was a, a transition fuel, Al Kabi said, no, it's a destination fuel. And so uh, t talk to me about this debate. How long are we going to continue to use gas? Because I think everybody agrees with you, at least most people will agree with you, that moving from coal to gas, diesel to gas, moving to gas by and large is going to get us to net zero faster. Yeah, of course, destination, transition. At the end, I will tell you, we need this natural gas to make this uh, transition to have a reliable electricity system, by the way. You know what the world has discovered, even in Europe this year, is that reliability, security of supply is just fundamental, you know, affordability as well, and sustainability. And we need, we have this trilemma, and we need to tackle with it. So I think for me, that we'll, be, we'll need gas for very long. Yeah. Oil as well, by the way. But even in the net zero scenario of AIA, if you look at it, you still have 25% of the mix, and, uh, of, which are hydrocarbons in 2050. So it's not getting rid of, out of it. So for me, uh, uh, what I would say, when I'm using transition, is not to say that it's transient. It's because I think that really it's one part of the solution to, uh, to get to net zero. As I said, let's shift uh, natural to, uh, coal to natural gas. By the way, when we, as Total Energies, we are one of the largest players uh, in the LNG industry. Uh, people ask us to count the scope-free emission of or gas, natural gas. I have asked my teams, and we will publish it. Let's look who is buying our LNG. And if we can demonstrate that the buyers of LNG are, in fact, substituting coal by gas, then what we, when we sell it, it's positive for the atmosphere. Because at the end, it's not a matter of scope free or I don't know what. It's a matter of what are the CO2 emissions which are going to the atmosphere. And it's much better to, to use gas than coal. So I think that's, uh, that's again. By the way, uh, as I say, I, I, I like both uh, Suel and uh, Sahad. We are a big player in both countries, yeah. or in Abu Dhabi, gas in Qatar. But I think uh, we need all of that, in fact, the reality. And again, for me, the lesson of 22 is, is quite clear. Uh, look, even I'm in the US, where it's a very large LNG country. We have been the largest exporter of LNG uh, uh, from the US. People don't know that, but Total Energies last year exported okay. 10 million tons from the US, and we intend to grow. So we are a very large player. Uh, but, uh, uh, um, and, but at the same time, in the US, you know, the debate was interesting. On one side, Biden administration said uh, one year ago, uh, you need to diminish your emissions, and then this year, you need to, to drill more. So why? Because, because oil and gas, for the time being, are the energy of our life. That's yeah. simple. And so there is no other way to escape. Then the question is, and for me, this decade is to be serious about building a new energy system with much more decarbonized energy. So we need to be very serious, very serious in investing. And Total Energy will invest in 25 billion dollars in these new energies, renewables and other molecules. But at the same time, it's, it's no way to think that we can make the, uh, gain the transition by cutting the supply of oil and gas while we don't still have built this new energy system. If we do it, price go to the roof and everybody complain. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the balance that we must find. And, uh, and at the same time, because it's not a matter of fossil fuel, it's a matter of emission. And it's why I think the message to an all oil and gas community must be serious about cutting emissions. Where in the company I'm very serious about is cutting my scope one and two emissions. I'm responsible of the scope one and two. And I need to leverage technology. I need to leverage anything to, to, to get it. If I can produce oil and gas with no emission, I've done my job in my production. Then the question is the demand. If car manufacturers decide, decide to shift yeah. from thermal engine to electric cars, fine. There is no market. It's, this is the answer. But I don't build the cars. I don't build the planes. I don't know. So it's, it's, the scope free, by the way, for me, is a problem because it's more a question of demand. And the demand is not done by the supply, contrary to what people think. The supply is there because there is a demand. So let's work as well 
on the demand. But our job yeah. is to cut our emissions. I, th I think that's a terrific answer, focusing on the emissions rather than some other areas that uh, might get our focus. Largest exporter from the United States, I think a lot of people uh, watching right now don't know that. And that's the largest exporter of all energy? Of, uh, LNG. Of, LNG. Of, of LNG. LNG. LNG, because we have positions in many, in many of the projects. And we intend to grow. We are not only shareholders of Cameron, but we are also of taking for many, uh, many of the plants. And we intend to continue to develop this position because Total Energy is, in fact, uh, managed last year 48 million tons of LNG. It's 12% of the world market, you know. And it's why, and by the way, in Europe, we have uh, access to, we control 15% of the regas capacities. So last year, we were the most active players mm -hmm. to supply LNG from the US to Europe. And we run our regas capacities at 85% last year. So, of course, this is where, when people tell me, what, what, is, what is it useful to have total energy in Europe? We are useful because we contribute directly to the, to the security of supply by get, getting this LNG to Europe last year when we are facing some potential shortage. Um, thank you for that. And Patrick, what you're talking about is what we at the Atlantic Council have been talking about is energy pragmatism, uh, so an all-of-the-above sort of approach. But you have investment decisions that you make. You talked about a $5 billion investment in renewables. Um, you posted a record uh, profit of 36.2 billion, so a doubling of profit this year. That means you've got a lot potentially to invest. Uh, what are you invested in? And how do you decide how to invest in? And, and as you know, a lot of people have been talking about, worried about disinvestment in uh, oil recovery and, yeah, and, but and gas recovery. So how do you plan to spend all this money? You know, uh, first, I want to tell you, this year, if you compare the results of all the five ma main majors, we are the most, profitability, prof most profitable. We have a return on capital employed of 28%. We are number one. And we are the one who invests the more, most in low carbon energies, renewable and uh, hydrogen and all that. Four billion in 22, five billion in 23. So it's not true, but you cannot combine both. Being very profitable on my hydrocarbon business and investing for the future. That's the whole model that we have designed. This is why we shifted, we moved from total to total energies, because we have a multi energy uh, strategy, all gas and electricity. Uh, and of course, we it's very important to be profitable to continue to invest in oil and gas because if I can invest five billion in low carbon energy in 23, it's because I have made the money from oil and gas. So we continue to invest in oil and gas. Last year, we acquired some new giant fields in Brazil. We have launched new uh, oil, oil projects like the one in Uganda and others. We are working hard to continue to produce the oil production in Abu Dhabi, where you were mentioning. Uh, we have last year acquired the main the largest uh, international share in the Qatari projects. Uh, so we are very serious about continuing to develop and also to build the future. Allocation of capital, we will invest this year 16 to, eight, to 18 billion dollars in 23. Let's say 12 around hydrocarbon and five in low carbon energy. With 12 billion dollars, the, the, our, our objective is to continue to maintain we have the idea on the old side to, to maintain, or to be a stable production during this decade, and we continue to grow our LNG business, uh, which is one of the pillars of the growth. But it's also important for us, as I said, to, de to deploy these investments in building the future of energy. Because whatever, I don't know what is the pace of the transition, but what is clear is that technologies like EVs are coming. So the oil market, at a certain point, will begin to decline. I don't know when exactly, people say 25, 2030, but we need to build, and this is why we invest in electricity, because this is a growing market, and I'm absolutely convinced that the more we'll need uh, electricity, the more price will go up. So it's a good business to invest. And just briefly, as you're looking at the gamut of renewable technologies or decarbonization technologies for carbon, what gets you excited? What, what technologies uh, do you think have the most promise? Oh, there are a lot of technologies there, but uh, again, it's not the solar one, which is for me already at, uh, at a very high level and it's almost bottom, but you are on offshore wind, you have some things on carbon capture, on storage, energy storage, electricity storage is just fundamental. To make all these investments profitable, you need to, to, to develop. We have, a, we have invested in a, in a battery company, which is owned by Total, Saft, and we make some progress on it, including with uh, our investments for batteries for EVs. 
I can tell you this is a segment where you have billions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of uh, people who are working and we should make big progress. And that's very excited, exciting because electricity is a problem you cannot store it today. And, uh, and so if we can store electricity, this will be a real uh, success for the future. Then, of course, the goal will be to make synthetic fuel mm -hmm. uh, from hydrogen plus CO2. It's a superb equation, you know, uh, yeah. hydrogen. You have to produce the hydrogen, green or blue, I don't care. Yeah. Low carbon hydrogen, what is clear. But CO2, we don't know what to do with this molecule. You produce uh, a synthetic fuel. It could be, uh, by the way, uh, quite interesting, a synthetic methane, for example, which means that we could continue to use our liquefaction facilities for long. Mm -hmm. And for the customer, the chemical industry in Germany, we will have to change nothing. So this is an interesting route. Or for sustainable aviation fuels, yeah. uh, synthetic fuels, we will have to, to find a way to, we will have to produce it because I don't know if we could escape from liquid uh, in, 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 in planes, you know, in, because of storage. So we need to find uh, this way. So these are probably also exciting. Having said that, it's still expensive today. But uh, uh, by the way, from this perspective, again, uh, the US might be a, uh, a land of excellence for us because uh, with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, there is a good incentive. It's a good, good law, to be honest, this act, which attracts a lot of European uh, players. Why? Because there is a real clear and simple incentive to invest in all these green infrastructures. And we need to make, uh, at a certain point, uh, 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 this, uh, uh, this, uh, jumping in, this jump in the future. So that's... Uh, but so I'm looking to maybe investing more in the, not maybe, to invest more in the US, in fact. Uh, I think you just got the attention of many of the people watching this show. Uh, we've got a lot of Europeans coming from Washington who are not saying uh, the IRA is a good law. So talk, drill down on that a little bit better. Why, why do you consider it as a, as a net good? Because I think that's, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think that's what you're saying. Um, and what specifically will you be investing in the United States? And what is your answer to Europeans who say this is protectionist, this is undermining the transatlantic relationship? Um, I think both are true. Mm. I will tell you what I'm thinking. Yeah. I think that this law is clearly a clear political decision by the US that they want to, that green industries will take place on their territory. That there is a transition, it's an opportunity and they want that to be done here and not to be done outside or like solar panels, everything today. 90% of solar panels are manufactured is in China today. Yeah. So which is, by the way, another problem of real dependency. So it's true that this law, but I think for me, uh, there is a trend which began a few years ago, uh, I would say, where uh, the US seems to not to believe fundamentally in the multilateral system of the WTO. So they create their own rule. That's why the Europeans who are fundamentally, yeah. I think, have a multilateral approach are not happy. In particular, because they can be translated even for them, European. There is no free trade agreement between Europe and the US. Or I don't know why exactly. And so the, from this perspective, there is a, a, a political issue. Having said that, uh, what I also think is that we could, should look at it as an opportunity for, and my, 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 my answer, my, my speech to Europeans is do the same. Let's do the same in Europe. Europe is a continent where we have the Green Deal. We, we will invest more than everywhere to go to net zero. We have higher ambitions. So we must take decisions in order that green industry should be located in Europe. Otherwise, if we invest and at the end we import in Europe goods and manufacture and electrolyzers from China or from the US, I'm not sure it's good for the European people. Yeah. So I think my, from my perspective, maybe I'm for a company like mine, we want to invest, it's easy to say. I think let's do, it. Let's do the same. Uh, and so I'm looking to the US. Yes, in the US, this uh, IRA is supporting, not only by the way, uh, hydrogen or carbon capture and storage, but also solar and wind. In fact, when you look at it, there is some technological, it's a technological neutral uh, act, which is good. And so for you know, last year, Total Energies, we have acquired the 50% of Clearway. We became number five in the renewable business here in the US. Mm -hmm. So. I didn't plan to have the IRA, so it's an upside to my investments, and I'm fine. Uh, there are some good advantages in the US because you have a lot of land, contrary to Europe, a lot of land, solar, wind. So um, let's work. But again, uh, I think the right answer is, so you have two debates, the multilateralism, what is the future of multilateralism, and 
again, the WTO, maybe we have opened too wide the door to China. It's why today people think that uh, the Western camp has been a little naive, and so we should uh, modify it. So that's the WTO. That's the geopolitical yep. commercial world business. And then you have green industry. Where do we invest? And we need to invest. We need to. So I think it's a, for, I, and I'm more looking to that as an opportunity than a, as a problem. Thank you for that answer. It's an excellent answer. And, and, and you said very quickly, I don't know why we don't have a bigger trade deal. We need that too. When we need an investment deal across the Atlantic, the Atlantic Council wants that badly. Let's talk a little bit about geopolitics. Uh, last year was a, a geopolitical shock of the war in Ukraine, led to an energy shock, had an, a macroeconomic shock, inflation, and all of that. Um, uh, you were and uh, uh, heavily invested in, in Russia. How do you see uh, your business evolving, but also how do you see the geopolitical tension uh, evolving? We're, we're still at war. The, the war's uh, ongoing. The, the war is there. I'm not sure it will end easily. And I have no idea. It's not yeah. my job, but I mean, yeah. I'm just observing that uh, it could be long. Because I think both the question is more that geopolitics yeah, yeah, inevitably has an impact on your business. Yeah, yeah, of course, for us, we had uh, heavily invested uh, $15 billion. By the way, we have impaired almost all of our Russian assets because we have step-by-step step progressively retracted from all, almost all of business in, in Russia. Uh, it took little time because it was big, but we have done it orderly. Uh, my view is that, um, and I'm always surprised about it, there are two views on this war. You have the Western views and you have the rest of the global South views. Yeah. When you were in Abu Dhabi and when I was in Davos, you know, uh, I had the feeling that there is a quite a large community in the world. You know, we are only one billion in the US and Europe. Mm -hmm. We are five or six billion, which looks to that as a, almost a regional conflict, you know. Yeah. They don't see that as a fight of democracy against autocracy, uh, like we have this perception in Europe and in the US with the support right. of the I think. And that's we have to be probably careful in the Western world not to believe that all view is the dominant one. It's not the dominant one. Today, in the Middle East, in Asia, in Asia, in Africa, first, their duty is to, to continue to, uh, to develop their economies, to get people out of poverty. The market for Middle East countries is Asia, fundamentally. Yeah. And they are turning more and more to the East. It has to, we have to get to India and to China. And so this part of the world is much more populated than us. And so we have to be careful not to make a mistake. And from this perspective, by the way, the climate debate is interesting because it has a trend, cop after cop, to become a fight between the West and the rest of the world. It should not be. It, it, yeah. Let's avoid antagonism. Let's, be, uh, let's keep humility. Let's listen to these leaders. Uh, because again, otherwise, we, uh, we could maybe be right between us, but not be right with the rest of the world. So that's an advantage. For me, uh, this war is a signal of uh, the end of a globalization world, or at least a political globalization. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not for trade, but it's the end. We see some fracturation. And one of the challenges, I think, for political leaders is the vote that this, uh, the gap between our world, our democratic world, and uh, this emerging world uh, will widen in the future. So we have to continue to be serious about it. You know, you, you should remember that from their point of view, uh, when we decided to put all the sanctions in, uh, on Russia, which were, of course, legitimate, we just forget to ask them their rights. We first took the sanctions, and then we go to the UN. We went to the UN, tell them, please, approve. I'm not sure this was really well perceived. I'm even sure it was not by these countries. We must respect these countries. They have larger and larger economies. And again, they could have their free trade agreement between all of them. So it, it, we have it, to keep that in mind. It's such a good point. Perhaps 40 countries involved in sanctions on Russia, 140 not. And so that's exactly what you're saying. Uh, geographically, as you look at this from a business standpoint, you've talked about the opportunities in the US market. Where do you see the biggest opportunities? Some say it's Africa, some say looking to Asia. Uh, obviously, Europe is uh, uh, in, in a transition of its own that's very fast moving right now. As you look at the world geographically, where do you see the biggest opportunities? Well, you know, there are a lot of emerging economies. So uh, yeah. Brazil is an interesting country. India is an interesting one. Africa, of course, we have a very large player in Africa, knowing that the question of uh, 
uh, Africa is more an export country for the time being, yeah. but really investing in Africa, which maybe should be the best way when people complain. We will complain about the, the Chinese influence of, in Africa. In fact, it's because the Chinese are investing in Africa. We, we are investing in producing some natural resource to export that away. So the question for us is, do we want to invest more? And by the way, for Total Energies, you know, uh, I want to use this renewable business, this electricity business, as a way to reinvest part of the profits that we do in Africa inside the countries. And I think it's one of the answers. Yes, we produce oil and gas from uh, Uganda or Mozambique tomorrow, but we will reinvest part of it, and they need electricity. When you don't have electricity in a country, it's difficult to, to raise uh, an economic growth, you know? So I think it's also part of maybe a way to uh, to contribute, I would say, to these uh, developing economies, or serve to reinvest in the country. And electricity is giving us this possibility. What a fascinating job you have. So we're down to our last couple of minutes. We have questions. Some of them are quite specific, but I'll just do, because we're running out of time, I'll g give you two questions with a great deal of specificity. I think these are experts. So uh, Abdel Krim uh, Khatib asks, uh, hello, in the context of green energy, on the sea pi water pipelines toward the Sahel in isolated areas in parallel with the future of total energies pipelines toward the north. So he's asking you about what's happening in these pipelines uh, around Sahel. And then, uh, and then from, from Andre Brandi, uh, what's the state of Total's offshore oil interests block 58 in Suriname? So I've got- This one is for yep. investors in, yep. in one of my partners. <laughs> if I recognize the question, so, uh, <laughs> but it's a specific one. I can just tell on this one that uh, we have drilled uh, recently a well, which confirmed that we have, would say, half of an oil development is now controlled. We have still two wells to drill, and I hope at the middle of the year that we could have a first oil development. The issue in Suriname is that there is a lot of hydrocarbon, but a lot of oil and gas. We don't flare gas in our development. It's uh, a principle. And so, and finding a, a market for gas in Suriname is not so easy. So that's, that's, a, that's a point. But we progress. So first question about pipeline. I'm not sure it, it, to, have it, an, uh, to uh, understand uh, water. I'm not in the water business. So, yeah, sea, uh, sea water pipelines, it seems to be something you're working on, but maybe It's not. probably, uh, no, I don't know. OK, it's probably we'll, around Iraq, we'll, we'll, but, leave uh, that. we'll see that. So let, let me end on a question that I'd love to end with, uh, uh, with uh, someone like you who has runs such a fascinating business with interests all over the world, geopolitical impact, macroeconomic impact, energy market impact. As you look forward to 2023, what gives you the most hope? And then what gives you the most concern? Uh, the most hope is the reopening of China because it will drive again back to growth, mm -hmm. I think. And I think maybe we are not far from that. Of course, it will have an impact on the energy markets. Uh, but I think that would be a uh, Part of uh, finding uh, it will be important to, to, to help to, uh, to know we have a depressed feeling today, recession. Or, uh, I think China has an important role, if it, it, it's, and I hope it, it will come. Uh, the risk the risk is uh, the, the, the widening gap between uh, the US and China. And I think that's really, uh, uh, that's really something which concerns us, including for a global company. Uh, uh, not one day to have a cho to choose between both. We don't want to choose between both. Yeah. We, want, we think, and I think, uh, even if uh, Putin, unfortunately, has uh, destroyed maybe the dream that uh, the global globalization will help to peace, we should not. F we should continue to work for it. And I think uh, uh, to try to maintain the world as global as possible is important. So uh, avoiding some uh, more gaps. Uh, and I think honestly. The US is a strong country here. Yeah, you have everything. You have the people, you have the technology, and you have the natural resource. So I don't know why you should fight against China. You can do it by yourself. Um, I think that's a good place to end with the, the hope being uh, China, uh, Chinese growth returning to the market, and then the concern uh, also China with bilateral relations. And the hope there would be that we can find a better way to navigate uh, our bilateral relations. Um, but that's going to depend on a lot of factors from the Chinese side as well, I think. For both sides, yeah. of course. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, wonderful conversation. Thank you for tuning in and, uh, and for being here in the room th this morning in Washington, D.C. And we, I hope we can do this uh, on a regular basis. Fascinating, a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.